the time. Uh, I'm also a living historian, which is different than a reenactor. A reenactor portrays a generic individual that would have lived uh, during the war between the states, um, artillery, infantry, cavalry, marine, navy. A living historian is an individual who looks uh, at a specific, who studies a specific indiv individual uh, for a period of time before taking that presentation public. The ones that you'll see most often are Abraham Lincoln. There are about 200 Abraham Lincolns running around the U.S. Uh, some are really good, others are working on their, on their front. Um, I portray two generals, George McClellan. Uh, I'm a volunteer with the National Park Service, George McClellan was at Antietam National Battlefield in Maryland, and I also occasionally do Phil Sheridan, who was at uh, Appomattox Courthouse in Virginia. That's where the Army of Northern Virginia surrendered. Robert E. Lee surrendered to Ulysses S. Grant and effectively ended the war, at least in the East it ended the war. When I chose McClellan, or it was chosen for me, I didn't realize that he was a Mason, so I was especially delighted that, uh, that we had that in common as well. Uh, McClellan was interpassed and raised in a one-day degree out in Portland, uh, Oregon. Uh, he was leading up, he was an engineer, and he, uh, he was leading up a group who were trying to find a route through the Cascade Mountains to form the Transcontinental Railroad. There was another group in St. Lawrence, uh, St. Lawrence, St. Louis, they were headed west, he was headed east, and the idea hopefully was that they would meet up. So he couldn't stick around and do the three degrees in the normal fashion, so they got dispensation. The lodge, Willamette Lodge number two in Portland, Oregon. They still exist. I've talked to the lodge historian. I've talked to the master. Yes, they're well aware that George McClellan was their brother. So that was, that was great to know. So anyway, he became a Mason in December of 1853, it was a good month for him. He just was promoted to first lieutenant and he just enjoyed his 27th birthday. So December was quite a busy month for him. Uh, what I'd like to talk to you tonight about is masonry during the Civil War. Uh, when the South Carolina militia fired on Fort Sumter, the federal garrison in Charleston Harbor, that effectively uh, began hostilities. Uh, Abraham Lincoln called up 90, uh, sorry, 75,000 volunteers for 90 days. It was going to be a short war, so 75,000 boys got called up to put down the rebellion, and of course it turned into something quite different. The first real battle uh, was at a place called Manassas Junction in Virginia. Um, the north, north and the South always have different names for battles. The North calls it Bull Run. The South calls it Manassas. It's the same battle. In fact, there were two battles there, a year apart. First Manassas, second Manassas. First Bull Run, second Bull Run. Okay, but this is the first one. The lines were very fluid. There was a colonel, a federal colonel called Rayner, R-A-Y-N-O-R, I believe it was. And uh, he was, he walked down, you know, the battle's going all around and it was a little bit of a lull. So he goes down to Manassas Creek to fill his camp, uh, his canteen. All of a sudden, he and his very small detachment get overrun by Confederate cavalry. There's a small skirmish. Uh, some of his escort are, are killed. The others take off. He gets captured. Uh, in fact, he gets clubbed over the head. Next thing he knows, he's waking up. Somebody's tugging on his jacket, and there's a Confederate soldier stripping the dead, taking their uniforms and their accoutrements, their guns, and, and so on and so forth. So he sat up, scared the bejesus out of this guy, and he took off, got on his horse, and he took off. So anyway, he got taken to an aid station. Well, the Confederates, of course, didn't want to help him. Uh, in fact, they continued to assault him and, uh, you know, further his injuries. Uh, and this one Confederate cavalry came up grabbed him basically by the arm, hauled him up in front of him, and took off. Took him to a federal, not a federal, Confederate aid station. The first surgeon they saw, he didn't want to work on a Union colonel. 
there were too many Confederate boys that needed help. He was just going to let this guy die. So this Confederate cavalryman searched around, found a uh, more benevolent uh, surgeon who turned out to be a mason, and so the colonel's uh, wounds were, uh, addre were dressed and so on and so forth. It came time for them to move out, and normally they take the prisoners with them. This same brother surgeon basically declared that the colonel was too sick, he was going to die, his wounds were fatal, there's no sense taking him with us, we just leave him here. In fact, he wasn't terminal. He, uh, he did survive the war, and uh, you know he was he reunited with the federal troops. So uh, that was that was the first in, written indication or, or history of masonry during uh, during the Civil War. Uh, 1863. The big objective of the federal government was to capture the Mississippi from St. Lawrence, St. Lawrence, St. Louis, all the way down to New Orleans. Uh, General Nathaniel Banks, who was not a Mason, was working his way up the, the Mississippi River. Uh, Ulysses S. Grant was coming down. The big problem, of course, was the city of Vicksburg, which is high up on, on a hill and was able to bombard the river. So it was really, really difficult. Um, there was a U.S. ship called the Albatross, USS Albatross. It's a side wheeler as opposed to a stern wheeler. Side wheeler has two big wheels on the side. It's actually quite a maneuverable boat. If you get going one way on one and the other way, you can spin that boat right around in one spot, okay? They put metal on the sides of it and they called it a tin clad as opposed to an iron clad. An iron clad is built from the hull up as a heavy warship. Tin clad basically is a civilian ship that's been purchased by the federal uh, government and they put some stuff on the side that basically did nothing more than protect against small arms fire. So the Albatross was in the river, St. Lawrence, uh, St. Lawrence, I keep saying that, I'm sorry. That's my Canadianism coming through. <laughs> the Mississippi River bombarding the city of Francisville. And uh, it was siege warfare. What they do with siege warfare is they'll fire two or three shots and then they'll sit for a minute, then they'll fire a couple at a different part and then they'll sit, and then they'll fire a couple over here. So the <coughs> inhabitants never know when the next round's coming. They never know where the next round's coming. So it's psychological warfare. The captain of the Albatross was a Mason and so was the ship's surgeon. The captain had yellow fever at four o'clock in the afternoon, June 13th. 1863, all of a sudden there's a single shot. The officers go into the cabin. Here's the captain. He's basically shot himself in delirium. Now, they're in the Mississippi River. It's only 30 feet deep. You cannot bury, you cannot do a burial at sea. You can't go on either shore because you're gonna get shot at. You can't keep the body on board because June, Mississippi in June is kind of warm and they couldn't find a steel casket which is about the only way that they could preserve a body in those temperatures. So just as quickly as you know, the firing's happening, it stops. And for about 20 minutes, there is no, no sounds. Um, a John boat is lowered into the water. The ship surgeon goes ashore with a flag of truce to see if he can get a Masonic funeral for the captain. Uh, there was a Confederate officer on leave there. He was the senior deacon of the lodge um, in St. Francisville. Uh, and he said, yes, he said, basically, I hate you with every bit of my soul, but as a brother, I am obligated to give your captain a Masonic funeral. And they buried him, they conducted a funeral, and they buried him in Grace Episcopal Church in uh, Francisville, Mississippi. Um, afterwards, the surgeon uh, invited the Confederates on board, you know, for a dinner, and they said, "No, nah, that's that's we can't do that. Just absolutely no way." And he says, "Well, what do you need?" He, and the Confederates said, "We need medicine. Whatever you've got, bandages, uh, quinine, you know, for malaria, um, you know, whatever you've got, and can spare." So the ship surgeon basically put together a very large package of medical supplies, sent it ashore for the, uh, the Confederates. 
A couple of hours later, the bombardment resumed, but for some strange reason, the federal gunship had lost the range to the city. All the shells were now landing in the river, or they were sailing right over the city and landing in the swamp behind. So that's, uh, that is a story. And the lodge that's there, every June, they conduct this, this uh, uh, funeral that took place. And I've been in touch with the master. It was in June. I couldn't do it because I was traveling with the, the Grand Master. But uh, next year I plan to go. It's called The Day the War Stopped, and they conduct this funeral. Uh, it's a lodge event, and uh, I'm going to go next year. It should be a lot of fun. Um, I'll give you a third one. Uh, that's probably all I have. Time Savannah, for. Georgia. There was a prison camp. The federal government basically blockaded all the harbors. All it was called the Anaconda Plan. Basically, stopped all shipping to get into the Confederacy, starving. And it went all the way from uh, Norfolk, Virginia, all the way around to Brownsville, Texas. They couldn't blockade Mexican ports because that would get the you know, they'd be in another war with Mexico and they didn't need that, but um, anyway, they effectively blockaded all the ports. Um, the prisoners were allowed to write home. So the prisoner wrote home, he was a corporal or something, wrote home to his parents and he said, you know, one of my big regrets is I only made it to Fellowcraft. I did not get raised. I basically signed up Mr. Lincoln's army and here I'm sitting and you know I don't know if I'll survive this and I really regret now that I didn't get my third degree before I signed up and joined the Federal Army. So the family writes to the Grand Lodge of New York who writes to the Grand Lodge of Georgia. Now New York and Georgia are at war with each other but the two lodges, the two Grand Lodges are talking to each other and they said would you do this favor, would you please raise our brother before anything happens to him. And so he's sitting in the prison camp one night and all of a sudden these Confederate officers all show up at the Commandant's office with a summons for him. He gets hauled off. He gets taken away and he's, uh, he's bound because, you know, they don't want him taken off, scampering off into the woods and getting away from them. Uh, and so he, they take him to a lodge and they basically raise him. Now the arrangement was he was supposed to be turned, returned, to the prison camp, but he escaped. Somehow he escaped. <laughs> and um, so basically what happened was they took him to uh, Tybee Island uh, and they said, you see those lights out there? Those are your federal warships. They're blockading Savannah Harbor. Uh, here's a boat, here's a pair of oars. Uh, you know, if you don't get shot by our guys, and you don't get shot by your own guys approaching the warship, that's your way home. So he rode out there and he, he actually got on board. Well, they want to know who these guys were. Did they know who they were? And so on and so forth. He says, yeah, no, I know exactly who contributed to my welfare. His name was Hiram. <laughs> so that was, and that's a documented case. It's been, I'm sure it's been augmented a few times, but uh, you know, it is, it is historical. So, I don't know, how are we doing on time? Got one more? Or are you? No? Okay, all right. Do you have any questions? Any burning questions about the war between states? You see, I didn't call it the Civil War. Civil War indicates there's one government and you've got two warring factions. There were two governments. There was one in Washington, there was one in Richmond, so it is not a Civil War. War is never civil, but it's not a Civil War. Congress actually declared a few years ago and its proper name is the war between the states. So, that's it. All right? <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you.